Uh, yes. So uh, I welcome everybody who's uh, registered and logged in for this webinar on home-based workers. Uh, we have two guests here. Uh, we have Dr. Marty Chen. Uh, Marty is a lecturer in public policy at the Harvard Kennedy School and an affiliated professor at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. She is uh, also the co-founder and international coordinator of Vigo. Vigo is um, a global research policy network that seeks to improve research, statistics, and policies related to the working poor, especially women, and especially in the informal sector. Dr. Marty Chen is a renowned development scholar and has steered Vigo since its inception, turning the research policy and action network into one of the world's leading organizations focused on the informal economy. She was awarded the High Civilian Award Padma Shri by the Government of India in April 2011 and the Friends of Bangladesh Liberation War Award by the Government of Bangladesh in December 2012. Good morning and a very welcome to Dr. Marty Chen. Good morning, Shalani Ben. <laughs> I have with me a Ben from um, the Delhi, member of Seva Delhi, member of RUAP and she's an embellishment worker, a home-based worker, and she will be joining us also in this webinar. Uh, she will speak in Hindi. I will translate for her. Every time we ask her a question, I will first ask her uh, a question in Hindi, wait for her to reply in Hindi, and then I will translate both the question and her response in English. Aapka swagat Thank you. Um, so um, again, once again, very welcome. And I will begin with Dr. Marty Chen. And I want to ask her um, very basics at the very beginning. And please explain to us who are the home-based workers and what do they do? Thank you, Shalini Ben. Uh, home-based workers are those workers who produce goods and services from in or around their own homes. And they produce goods and services in multiple sectors. They're found in pretty much every branch of industry and in countries rich and poor. Um, they stitch garments, they uh, weave textiles, they show so shoe uppers, they roll incense sticks, cigarettes and cigars, they thread flower gardens, garlands, they prepare food items, they also are involved in high-tech industries, they assemble electronics, they uh, package pharmaceuticals, uh, they make automobile parts, uh, and they provide services from in and around their homes, laundry, haircutting, mechanical repairs, clerical and professional work as well. Okay, thank you, Martin. That was very, very helpful. But how many would they be? Home-based workers? Um, and also, how many women amongst the home-based workers, particularly in the context of India and South Asia? Thank you. Uh, we know the percentage of women workers and total workers that are home-based, it's harder to get absolute numbers. So let me share some percentages with you. We know that they represent a significant share of all workers, especially in Asia and especially for, um, for women. In other parts of the world, uh, in Africa, we know that 6% of all workers in South Africa are home-based and 3% of all workers in Buenos Aires, Argentina are home-based. That's where we have available data. And we are fortunate to have uh, good data for four countries in South Asia due to a collaboration between HomeNet South Asia and the WeGo network I represent. And so we know that in for, uh, home based workers represent uh, as much as 15% of all workers outside agriculture in India, and 30% in Nepal, 
and a slightly lower percent in Bangladesh and Pakistan. But among women workers, the percentages are very high. Uh, in Nepal, almost half of all women workers are home-based outside of agriculture. 40% in Pakistan, over 30% in India, and around 12% in Bangladesh. So yes, a large number of the informal sector workers, including women, are working as home-based workers. Yes. But, um, yes, please go ahead. Yes. And we, there is an estimate that suggests in India that half of mm -hmm. all manufacturing units are home-based. And we know they uh, produce from the homes, 80% of automobile parts are produced in homes in India. So this is considerable and uh, a very large number. But are they all, you know, I know you mentioned that they work in different sectors, but are they the same type of work arrangements, uh, uh, same type of home-based workers, or are there different uh, types of home-based workers? Thanks for asking that, because there are two broad categories of home-based workers. There are the self-employed, and then there are the subcontracted. Um, and the self-employed buy their own raw materials, supplies, uh, negotiate their own work orders, and sell their own finished goods, while the subcontracted uh, rely on firms and their intermediaries, their contractors, for work orders, for raw materials, and for the sale of finished goods. But I think it's really important to note that actually the self-employed and the subcontracted share much in common because even though they are dependent, the subcontracted workers provide the workplace, which is their home. They provide the equipment. They have to buy some of the supplies like needles and machine oil for their um, sewing machines. And um, they pay for electricity and they pay for the transport of coming and going to the contractor to get work orders and return finished goods. So they share um, many of the non-wage costs of production. Thank you for giving us that perspective, Marty Ben. I am going to now ask Sudha Ben, who's here, and I want to ask her uh, about her work, how did she start, and what, uh, what kind of work she was doing. So, I want to ask you that when did you start this work and what did you start this work and why did you start this work? So, I was like, I was like, I was like, I was like, So, I have a small, small child. My son has a son. He 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 has a son. So, I have a son. He has 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 a son. उन लोगों बहनों से पूछी कि हम ये तो काम हम भी कर सकते हैं क्या काम देखे जाता था हाँ इनका वही मोती सितारे लगाने का इंब्रोइडरी एम्बेलिशमेंट हाँ पीस का तो रेट और भी अच्छा नहीं था उसका लेकिन वो दिया है मुझे मतलब दो रुपए तीन रुपए रेट का था मुश्किल से बहुत दो तीन सौ रुपए कमा लेते उन और काम मिलता था काम बराबर नहीं देता था कब पंद्रह दिन तो मिला तो दो चार दिन लगातार मिला नहीं तो महीने महीने गायब हो जाता था काम नहीं मिलता था अब मैं आपकी बात को अंग्रेजी में बोलूँगी I asked Sudha Ben how and when did she start this work she said she when she came to Delhi after marriage her children were young husband did not hold a good job she really needed money to run the house so in the neighborhood, when she went around, she saw other women um, being given the work of embellishment, a particular kind of embellishment, which is uh, embellishing small um, sitaras and uh, things. Uh, uh, so she said that this kind of work was available and she could see other people in her uh, locality doing that work and that work was being given by a subcontractor. So she asked the subcontractor if she could get that work. So he started giving it to her. 
but um, uh, she used to do this work but was paid very little 100 uh, 100 rupees sometimes in a month sometimes not even that and the work uh, i asked her if the work was regular and she said it was very irregular sometimes they would be work for a week four or five days and sometimes for months they would not be work but because she needed this for her family she continued to work i'm going to ask her another question आप ये बताइए कि फिर और वो पैसे आप काम करती थी तो पैसे आपको दे देता था जैसे मतलब कभी कभी तो दस बीस रूपए पचास रूपया वो दे दिया दो तीन सौ रूपया तो लेके भर नहीं गया पैसा भी टाइम से नहीं देता था बहुत दिक्कत होती थी पैसे के लिए और वो कहा ये काम किसके लिए करवाता था ये बताता था किसी कंपनी जैसे डायरेक्ट जो स्पोर्ट कंपनी होती थी वहाँ से काम लेता था लेकिन कंपनी का नहीं हमें पता था ना कॉन्ट्रेक्टर का पता था ये कहा रहता है तो वहाँ हम जा सके इतना समर्थ नहीं था कि हम वहाँ तक जाए तो what she is telling me is that uh, she was not paid regularly even for the work that she was done she was not paid regularly it was always delayed payment and on several occasions the contractor ran away with some of the money for her that was due to her and she could not get it done i then asked her um, whether she knew uh, the contractor or who the contractor was working for and she said that she knew he was working for some export orders for some export agency but she was not very uh, clear which export order it was agency it was she also didn't know where the contractor lived so she could not even go and ask him for uh, uh, her payment i am going to come back to you uh, dr chen and i want to ask you if the scenario that uh, uh, our sister here from the slums of delhi has explained is it a common kind of uh, issue that uh, home based workers face particularly women home based workers thank you sudha ben for your story and yes the scenario that sudha ben has outlined uh, is very common for the subcontracted workers so the problem of irregular work orders um, delayed payments low peace rates and lack of knowledge of the value chain to know where their goods are sold at what price are very common in among the subcontracted workers making it hard for them um, to be able to bargain effectively for more regular orders and sometimes also they're cheated on the raw materials that are supplied uh, and we find this around around the world and it's a nature of how the supply chain actually works thank you very much for explaining that marty ben just want to ask one other question about her place of work so jab aap ghar se kaam karti thi sudha ben to aap kidhar kaam karti thi matlab kahan pe bahar baithti thi chhota sa room hai usme teen bacche husband wife hum log bhi rehte the choti si balcony thi and I often used to, and there was a little balcony attached to my room, and I used to often sit there. But the place was very small, and it was very, very difficult to work in those conditions. But what could I do? I really needed that income at that point in my life. So, uh, uh, Marty Ben, then my second question to you is about uh, this: about uh, um, the. Uh, the place of work that home based workers are which is their own home which also doubles up as their living places and what kind of um, uh, problems that that poses for uh, a home based worker again uh, sudha ben thank you for sharing because what you have described is very common as well we have the wego network together with the home nets have done studies of home based workers and for the most part they live in single room dwellings maybe a second room 
uh, often with a little portico or balcony um, attached. But combining living and working in that very limited space is extremely hard. And when the children come home from school, when the husband comes home from work, when neighbors drop by for a cup of tea, uh, the work gets uh, disrupted. Often they have to put away um, their, uh, the materials they're working with, sort of dismantle the works space itself to accommodate the other activities in the home. So the size of the home is a real uh, factor in the productivity of these women. Also the quality, if, if the home is um, kacha materials, as we say in India, non-permanent non materials, the problem of flooding or leaking, of dampness, um, all make it hard to store the raw materials and preserve the finished goods from any kind of damage. Uh, so the quality and the size of the home is very important. And I should add the location um, because if she's working as a home-based worker in a community where other home-based workers are working, there's generally a contractor somewhere in the vicinity nearby. Um, but if she gets relocated to the periphery of the city, as so often happens when slums are relocated, she loses that contact and often the sisterhood of other women in the community. And then the transport costs become crippling. And we did a study uh, in three cities in Asia and we found that transport was one third of the business costs of home-based workers. And we found that of those who had to spend on transport, couldn't just walk to the contractor or to the market, uh, one third operated at a loss. So that the earnings are so slim, if your transport costs go up with being relocated, uh, it becomes a losing proposition for many home-based workers. Uh, thank you, Marty Ben. I want to go back to um, one issue that you dwelt on and she also mentioned, which is that working from home. So uh, the, the constraint uh, uh, that, that emerges out of the fact that you're working from home, but also the isolation, the disconnect with the larger um, community, the disconnect with the larger labor movement. How does that impact and uh, do you see it in other parts of the world and other sectors of the home-based workers also? Yes, I think the isolation of being working in your own home is a major factor in at least two regards, uh, important regards. One is knowledge of the market, of knowing uh, market trends, product design, pricing, where are the good suppliers, do they have quality stock, all of that market knowledge that one needs to be a productive worker is, is particularly hard um, for women home-based workers, particularly for those who work from their home because of social norms that dictate that women shouldn't move outside the home, shouldn't deal with strangers. It makes them particularly isolated, but it also isolates them from other workers in their sector. So it makes it harder to actually organize and to find solidarity with other workers um, and to be able to learn from other workers uh, how they have dealt with these constraints and together to bargain for a better deal. Um, so the isolation is a very big factor. Uh, for those who work from their own homes. But um, the other question that I wanted to ask, again related to the fact of isolation, is that uh, have we got evidence to show that the wider economic trends and um, uh, trends like recession impact home-based workers or because they are so small and they are working from the confines of the home, are they sort of protected? Um, from some of these, uh, if not, then how, how do they cope with them and how does it manifest itself in their work and uh, earnings? You've raised a really important point, Shalini Ben, because most policymakers 
don't see these workers. They're not visible because they're isolated in their home. And so they don't even stop to think how wider economic trends will impact on um, the home-based workers who are, again, 30% of all women workers in India. So we have done a series of studies, one on the impact of the Great Recession on uh, informal workers, not just home-based workers. And of course, the home-based workers who were collect connected to uh, global supply chains, export manufacturing, they felt the impact of the Great Recession almost as soon as anyone did because export manufacturing sort of uh, really ground almost to a halt. Uh, we did find a difference. Those who were in domestic supply chains could keep going a little bit better than those in the export. We also have found in our study of home-based workers in three cities in Asia that inflation has a huge impact on them, um, that the prices for their supplies increase but the consumers, if they're in the domestic chains, are often other poor people and they can't raise their own selling prices. And the piece rates that they get from the global supply chains don't change maybe even in 20 years, no matter what the fluctuations in the economy. And we also have looked at um, effects on demand and effects in, on competition. So when you have an economic recession, like the Great Recession, you find other women or men coming into the home-based worker sector, increasing competition. Um, when you have political unrest in neighboring countries, we see this in Thailand, you have migrant workers who come in and start working in the home-based uh, worker sector. So competition increases. And then, of course, with, with a widespread recession, demand will also um, drop. So I think it's very important for us to realize that the poor, when these broader economic trends happen, are not just affected as consumers, they're affected as producers. And we tend to look only at the formal enterprises and the impact of demand and prices and competition on them. But we need to realize at the base of the economic pyramid, those same impacts are happening. Thank you very much. Uh, you've referred to several studies and Vigo's work with home-based workers. I want to ask if there is a common set of demands that has been articulated by the Vigo network um, for the home-based workers, especially those that are particularly critical for the women home-based workers. And if there is um, a, a policy response that uh, uh, Vigo Network uh, has put out as a, a sort of, uh, uh, you know, a solution to some of these issues that we have raised. Thank you. Uh, the Vigo Network is very committed, as you know, to working with uh, informal workers, home-based workers, and their organizations to develop uh, platforms of demands. And we also are very involved in facilitating delegations of workers to go to global forums. So uh, in advance of the um, discussion at the International Labor Organization on the formalization of the informal economy, in advance of the Habitat 3 negotiations of the new urban agenda, we convened workshops in different regions of organizations of informal workers, including home-based workers, and have pulled together a platform of demands. And I would divide them for home-based workers into three, let's say, sets. One is the common demands with all informal workers, which is a demand for legal recognition and identity as workers. It's a demand for uh, social protection coverage, the demand for recognition of their organizations, and there are, they are organizing, a point that I know Sudha Ben's example will illustrate. Uh, so recognition of their organizations and the right to a seat at the policy table when decisions are being made 
in cities, in national governments that would affect their work and their lives, they would like a seat at the table. And then when it comes to home-based workers in particular, there's a set of demands around the value chain dynamics, which we've talked about, the peace rates, the irregular orders. So there's all of that negotiating. But there's a set of demands that relate to public policy, particularly urban policies. And these have to do with uh, the policy of the city towards informal settlements and informal housing. Will they get de facto tenure and in situ upgrading, which is the preferred option? Or will they be relocated to the periphery of the city? Uh, the second is the provision of basic infrastructure services and transport services, where they work and where the markets are. Um, and zoning becomes an important public policy because if you have a single use zoning, which means that she's living in her home, but she wants to work in her home, a single use zoning dictates that she can only live in her home, she can't work in it. And so there's an effort now to get cities to understand that if you allow residents at least to work in their own resident residential areas within certain boundaries, not toxic noise or other factors. It's very important, especially if you have such a huge um, share of your workforce that is zone based. So there are those three sets of policy issues that are very important. Thank you very much, Martin. I'm going to now ask uh, Sudha Ben here to tell us um, on her story, because I know that her story of organizing, of coming together has many lessons for all of us. I will ask you to ask us that you have been able to get the first time. Yes, I have been able to get the कंप्यूटर भी होता है मतलब पढ़ाई सिखाया भी जाता है मतलब आप जाके देखना तो मैं वहाँ गई दस रुपए पांच रुपए तक मेंबरशिप की पर्ची करते थे तो गई पांच रुपए मेंबरशिप कटवाई और वहाँ पे एड्रेस पे गई तो हमें ये पीस मिला ये पीस की मतलब अच्छा बना के लाना तो आप काम ढूंढने के लिए वहाँ गए काम ढूंढने के लिए गए अच्छा हाँ तो आपको उन्होंने एक पीस दिया आपका चेक करने के लिए हाँ कि म वहाँ पे क्या होता था वहाँ पे सेवा के ऑफिस में आप गई तो बहने क्या कर आपने देखा बहने काम कर बहुत सारी बहने थी वहाँ पे काम कर रही थी और आपके जैसा ही काम कर रही थी हाँ बहने का ही कर रही थी मैंने कहा इस चीज को तो हमें भी आता है एक चीज हम भी कर सकते हैं तो उन्हें हमें ये चीज दिया टेन रुपीस का था उस इतना सारे कि इसके दस रुपए हैं जब इतना बनाते थे हम तीन चार रुपए पाते थे और उसका दस रुपए तो जो कितना खुश हुए इतना कर दो वहाँ एक पीस दी उसको जब दूसरे दिन ले गए तब वो पीस दी मुझे तीस रुपए और आपका जो पीस पे जो आपने काम करा था उसका क्वालिटी उन्हें पसंद बहुत अच्छा लगा so एक मिनट रुकिए मैं थोड़ा सा इसको translate कर लेती हूँ। She told a very interesting story that became very difficult to work as they continued to work in the slum through the subcontractor. So one day the seva mobilizers came to her community and they wanted her to become members of seva. So she said, "What do people do?" Um, so they said, why don't you uh, visit our local office? We also do embroidery. We have a program for embroidery workers and we have other programs for computer training, etc. We also do capacity building for embroidery workers. Why don't you visit our office? So she went to visit the office and there she saw so many sisters working on the embroidery work. When she looked at it, she felt that she could also do it. So she said, why don't you give me some work? So they said, fine, you have to test for quality and one piece was given to her and she was assured a sum of 10 rupees which was much more than ever gotten with a subcontractor so she was delighted even with that one piece and went home and spent a lot of time 
working on it and did a good job. So when she came back, they really liked the quality of her work, the Seva people. She became a member of Seva and she started asking for more work from them. So then the next day she got two pieces and then subsequently more work from Seva. Mm -hmm. अब ये बताइए तो फिर आप सेवा के साथ जुड़ी वहां पे आप लोग आपको मालूम था किसके लिए काम करते हैं और आगे का अभी हमें बताइए कि आपने जो वहां से आगे बढ़ी तो फिर कैसे बढ़ी आप हम लोग तब घर में ले जाके जब सेंटर से फीस ले जाके काम करते थे सेवा से जुड़े हमें 8 साल हो गए अच्छा 8 साल से हम काम कर रहे दो साल के बाद जब हमारी क्वालिटी उनको बहुत अच्छा बेस्ट लगने लगा तो बोली कि आप यही पर काम कर सकते हो रहा तो तो बच्चे छोटे थे तो घर में ले जाके करते थे थोड़ा थोड़ा मेरा भी क्वालिटी भी अच्छी थी काम भी बढ़ता गया बढ़ता गया तो हमको फिर उम्मीद पे यहां रख लिए तब तो चार पांच पांच साल से हम परमानेंट वहीं पर बैठे और रुआब की भी जब संरचना हुई तो उसमें भी आपका हाथ था रुआब का शुरुआत 2011 में हुआ उसमें हमारी बहुत रुआब से हमारी महिला एक संगठन है उसमें बहुत सारी महिलाएं 250 महिला है अब उस बहनों के साथ हम लोगों ने मतलब शुरुआत किया इतना बढ़िया काम हम लोग का हुआ आगे बढ़ा क्वालिटी भी अच्छी थी हर चीज काम बाहर से भी काम आता है हमें इंडिया के लिए थोड़ी ना काम कर बाहर का भी काम कर अभी मैं इसको आपकी बात को ट्रांसलेट करूंगी। So once she started getting from work from Seva, she used to they had they would give out work and pay her for it. She really liked it and she would take home work. So she would go to the center, collect the sort of order and go home and work. But her because of the regular work that she was getting. She was her her skills were also improving, and she was doing good, better work. So initially, they asked her to come and work at the center, but she had young children; she couldn't. But after a few years, she decided to go to the center, and she started working there. In the meantime, um, uh, Seva also decided to promote an organization where she was. Uh, she uh, uh, she has been um, uh, with Seva for eight years, and in two thousand twelve, Bara me, ha, two thousand twelve, Ruab was. Uh, um, created and she was one of the people who were uh, um, critical to its creating one of the home based workers who sort of uh, took the lead. And basically, what Ruab is, it's a un unique model for garment production and sourcing, but it's owned and managed by the women themselves. And that is what she's saying that I, we created this organization where we work and we don't just work for local markets, we produce for international markets also. And I'm quoting her. She said very proudly that I feel very good that we are working. So, I ask you that if you join the group, what benefit did you get? We have, 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 इतने बहने को काम सारे बहने आई काम सबको मिलने लगा विदेश से भी काम आता है स्पोर्ट कंपनी से भी काम तो पहले तो आप घर से बाहर ही नहीं निकलते थे नहीं निकलते थे डर लगता था हमें तो कहीं जाने में मेट्रो में भी डर लगता था कि कहाँ जा रहे हैं मैं लेकिन सेवा में जब जुड़ी तो हमें बाहर भी भेजा गया मतलब लेकिन हमें जब अच्छा लगा तो हमें बहनों को भी ले आई बहनें भी जुड़ के आ रही इतनी खुश हो गई कि मतलब सेवा हम लोग के सो व्हाट बेन हेयर इज सेइंग दैट वन शी वाज शी जॉइन सेवा शी वाज सो मोटिवेटेड दैट शी स्टार्टेड टॉकिंग टू अदर एम्ब्रॉयडरी वर्कर्स इन हर कम्युनिटी एंड टोल्ड देम इवन दोस हु हैड रिस्ट्रिक्शंस ऑन मूवमेंट हु कुड नॉट गो आउट शी मोटिवेटेड देम टू जॉइन सेड इट इज सो मच बेटर आई एम सो हैप्पी and uh, she was able to facilitate she in fact um, became an organizer and organized more and more women and she said that it gave her so much confidence and uh, she gave an example she said now i go out i can talk to people earlier i used to feel so scared i could not even take the metro to travel from one place to another and now uh, we can uh, go out talk to people we have foreign exporters who are giving us orders so she feels uh, very proud to be a part of this organization. Or, 
and, and she mentioned to me twice sorry i i forgot to translate it last time that there are it's not a, a small organization by any chance there are 250 members from delhi and she also mentioned about how she felt empowered by the visits outside Delhi that she has done, especially to uh, Seva Gujarat, where the larger Seva movement started, and that she really valued this, these exposures that her association with Seva has given her. So, thank you very much. You have told us so well, but I would like to ask Marty Ben. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, I am going to ask Marty Ben. Um, uh, Marty ben, so this is a very good example, a very sort of inspiring example of an organization which has created uh, a model like Ruab. But there must be others in other part of the world. Um, and we, um, maybe you could tell us a little bit about some other um, initiatives of organizing, of giving voice, of increasing livelihood opportunities for home-based workers and from within India. Yes, thank you. And also, um, thank you, Sudha Ben. <laughs> <Danya Bad. laughs> um, we are pleased that home-based workers actually are organizing. And we now um, have three regional networks of organizations of home-based workers. Uh, the original was in Southeast Asia. Um, started uh, in the Philippines and Thailand and has expanded to include uh, Cambodia and Indonesia and uh, Laos. We have a home net South Asia, which includes five or six countries in the region and many affiliated organizations. And there's home net Eastern Europe that was started by an organization of home-based workers in Bulgaria. And the WeGo network is trying to build similar networks in Africa and Latin America, uh, where there are fewer home-based workers, but still significant numbers in craft and artisan production and other traditional activities. So I think the movement of home-based workers is alive and well. And um, perhaps I can give examples at the regional and then maybe the global, regional, and national levels of things that these organizations have been able to achieve. At the global level, way back in 20 years ago, there was a campaign for an ILO convention on home-based work that Sewa from India plus um, the original home net uh, and the ILO worked together to um, bring about. It was a multi-year campaign and the convention was passed in 1996, Convention 177. And during this year, 2016, to mark the 20th anniversary, there was a celebration in Ahmedabad hosted by HomeNet South Asia and Sewa and WeGo. There was an event at the International Labor Conference and there's been a campaign to get ratification. We also, um, as you know, Shalini Ben, because you were <laughs> heavily involved, in 2015, HomeNet South Asia and WeGo um, together hosted the first international conference of home-based workers and their organizations in New Delhi. It came out with a platform of demands um, and so there and there have been home-based workers in delegations to multiple international labor conferences and to the preparations for um, Habitat 3, the preparatory conferences. I know you went to one of them. So they have been seen and heard and felt, if you will, <laughs> um, on the global stage and were instrumental in putting informal livelihoods and the needs of informal workers into recommendation 204 from the ILO on formalization and the new urban agenda of Habitat 3. Uh, there have also been regional efforts uh, with SARC. SEWA and HomeNet South Asia have 
created a project called SABA, which is to set up trade facilitation centers and marketing, um, like perhaps not as uh, developed a model as Ruab has proved to be, but also supporting the marketing and product development. Uh, and then uh, there was a regional conference organized by HomeNet South Asia with HomeNet Southeast Asia in Thailand uh, to bring to the attention of city authorities from eight countries in the region the findings of um, a multi-city study done by the HomeNets of how city policies affect um, home-based workers. And I think, you know, coming out of that Asia city declaration and the Delhi declaration, uh, there was much greater recognition of the home as workplace and the fact that slums and squatter settlements are actually sites of economic activities. And there's a greater push to integrate home-based workers and their livelihood activities into local plans, economic plans and um, so I think we've come a long ways. HomeNet Thailand in, in Thailand um, has been very instrumental in pushing for a number of pieces of legislation and national programs. And they were part of the civil society movement that pushed for universal health care coverage that now extends to all informal workers, including home-based workers and they sit on some of the boards and implementation committees for the universal health scheme. Uh, they also pushed for a home workers protection act um, which entitles uh, home-based workers in Thailand to a minimum wage and some occupational health and safety provisions and all other sort of fundamental labor rights. Uh, they also worked with the Ministry of Health to get an occupational health and safety scheme three years for home-based workers and other informal workers. So there's a lot of work happening in Thailand and also in India, thanks to SEWA and its sister organizations, there's been a lot of work to improve the housing and the basic infrastructure services for home-based workers. The Sewa Mahila Housing Trust, uh, Sewa MHT, is very active in the provision of basic infrastructure services in slums and squatter settlements, but also in sort of advocacy campaigns to change national policy and state level policies uh, relating to housing and rehabilitation and basic infrastructure services. And uh, the Seba Mahila Housing Trust has pioneered housing finance um, for home-based workers. And Seba has recently uh, um, established a uh, housing finance corporation, um, the Seba Gririn Limited, um, for working poor women, including home-based workers. Uh, and then there are a lot of examples at the local level. So I would just say that um, many more home-based workers need to be organized, but more are organized than I think people understand. And there are these three regional networks, and there's a growing international movement of home-based workers that are pushing for the convention to be ratified, pushing for supportive public policies, and pushing for improved terms of trade within supply chains for home-based workers. Okay, thank you very much, Martin. That was very helpful. And I just want to mention that uh, uh, this discussion that we, we uh, which you have initiated in this uh, about the cities and the home-based workers, we would be carrying it to the webinar tomorrow and where we will have the um, representative from Seva um, Mahila Housing Seva Trust telling us about some of their initiatives and experiences. So yes, so we will carry some of your the learnings from you from today to ask some of the questions and understand the initiatives of Mahila Housing Seva Trust. So I think it has been a very very interesting discussion, and we have understood 
so much. You've given us a perspective which is both global, regional, and also local. And our Ben here from Seva has explained to us from the perspective of the grassroots worker what changes it can bring to her life. Before I wind up, just a couple of questions. There were some. There was registration and some questions, and many of them we have answered. I have looked at them. There is uh, uh, that. There, uh, there is a little bit uh, that I'd like you to comment on. Uh, two things. One is. Um, um, the global supply chain and home-based workers and how to bring awareness, how to bring visibility. These are the recurring themes that are um, uh, a part of the discourse on home-based workers. So would you like to comment or uh, reflect a little bit on it before we wind up this session? Yes, thank you. We all know that global supply chains is part of the new global economy and how production is being organized around the world. And I know there's a lot of attention paid um, to the workers in factories uh, in global supply chains, particularly in the garment sector, let's say, and what's happened in Bangladesh with some tragic uh, incidents. And the WeGo Network and SEWA have been long committed to pushing the analysis and the advocacy and action focus down the chain to the home-based workers um, who are subcontracted in these supply chains. And as Diane Elson, um, a leading feminist economist, observed at one of WeGo's General Assembly, she said, I cannot imagine a greater distance in terms of power than between the CEO of the lead firm in a value chain and the home worker who's producing goods for that value chain. So wealth and power distance between the CEO and the home worker. And the home workers, uh, as I said, and as we heard from Sudaban, earn very low peace rates and yet, they have to cover all these non-wage costs of production, the workplace, the, the equipment, the electricity, the transport. Uh, and if there's fluctuation in demand, the way that firms up the chain deal with it is they just don't provide any work orders to Sudha Ban and her sisters in these supply chains, um, making their earnings in their work very unstable and volatile. And I think uh, we are now engaged in an exercise to figure out what peace rates should actually be for um, the home-based workers in these supply chains. But it has to be above the minimum wage because the minimum wage assumes the worker is going to a factory where all the costs of production are paid for by the employer. But the home worker is having to pay many of the costs of production. So we need to really think through what uh, a decent peace rate should be for these workers. And we know that um, in export manufacturing particularly, early studies suggest 40 to 60 percent of the workforce in these global manufacturing supply chains are informal right and most of them are not in factories they're out in in the homes where they remain really invisible even to the activists even to the labor organizers so that has been in a very important uh, niche that led by say well the home nets and we go have tried to try to address thank you very much marty ben and uh, um, the point that you have raised that this invisibility in supply chains of the home-based workers and how they remain invisible to the, even those who, for whom they are producing at one end and at the other end, the labor activists and the labor movement. And um, uh, so the invisibility of uh, home-based workers, despite their large number, particularly in South Asia, is I think one of the issues uh, and the voicelessness, despite the fact that more and more organizations of home-based workers uh, are evident in this region. So with this, um, uh, we would like to conclude this webinar. And I'd like to thank Dr. Chen and Sudha Ben here, who came and shared with us 
uh, their um, views and expertise and it has been a great learning experience thank you very much so Roa, um, uh, Ben Shapiro wants me to tell you and the others that she's also a board member of Roa and she sits in the meeting and takes decisions. So yes, um, I've told her that we are feeling... You Hindi bolne ka, Hindi Hindi sunne ka, the both a chala gaye mujhe ki aapke pura itihas mujhe bhi pata laga ha. So thank you, thank you, thank you, Shalini Ben, for excellent moderating. Yes, thank you oh, so much. My pleasure. Yes, thank you. Okay.